Today I'm going to discuss oxygen transporters. Uh, the major proteins that are involved in this are hemoglobin and myoglobin. Hemoglobin is the oxygen binding protein that exists in the human blood. And binding oxygen is a reversible process. Myoglobin is also found in the muscle cells, and a way to remember that the myoglobin is found in muscle cells is the, the word um, myofibril, so both have the same prefix, myo. Now, these proteins are necessary for our blood to carry oxygen because regularly, oxygen partial pressure in the lung capillaries is only 90 tors, which allows only for about 4.1 milligrams of oxygen to dissolve for us to consume per liter of blood plasma. However, in that same liter, since we have about 150 grams of hemoglobin, we bind 70% more milligrams of oxygen. Now I'm going to discuss the heme group itself. The heme group is a non-polypeptide component added to proteins to bind oxygen. The lightly colored structure is the porphyrin backbone, protoprofen 9, um, chelated to an iron. I've highlighted the word chelated and will highlight many more words throughout my other videos. These are words that I find either good enough to be tested on the MCAT or just words I really want to make sure I remember without having to look them up. That way I could actually make flashcards to test myself about them. This is another functional group that I think is important. Porphyrin is a conjugated double bond system responsible for the color of blood. So when there is an oxygen deficiency or hypoxia, there is a blue discoloration known as cyanosis. Now central to the heme is the ionized iron, which can form coordinated double bonds. And most importantly to hu the human body, it binds oxygen and nitrogen. The iron does this by being in the ferrous state or the ferric state, which is Fe2+, or Fe3+, respectively. It enters this state by initially binding to a nitrogen from the proximal histidine on the APOP protein. After the proximal bond, the sixth bond to the iron is with the oxygen molecule. Now, two key points that I want to make is that the heme iron is always in the ferrous state in hemoglobin and myoglobin. And another key point is that when in the ferrous state, iron is bonded to oxygen, it is oxygenated, but it is not oxidized to the ferric state. I'm going to discuss myoglobin. The proximal histidine is denoted as F8. The alpha helices of the myoglobin are labeled A through H. So that means that the proximal histidine occurs on the sixth alpha helix, denoted F. Hydrophobic interactions are the interior forces that establish the tertiary structure. However, the exterior of the myoglobin has hydrophilic interactions, making it soluble in H2O. And the half of the heme group containing the propionate groups faces the water. There also exists a distal histidine, E7, with enough of a gap for O2 to bind to the chelated iron. So, as I stated earlier, myoglobin plays a significant role in facilitating the diffusion of oxygen into muscle cells. Myoglobin is also theorized to play a significant role in carrying oxygen in aquatic animals. If you were to look at myoglobin's oxygen binding curve, you would see that it binds oxygen very tightly. Researchers have knocked out the genes for myoglobin, and it led to compensatory adaptations, such as higher hematocrit levels, and increased capillary density in the muscle cells to compensate for that loss of myoglobin, which indicates that myoglobin plays a critical role in the oxygen transportation to the muscle cell. Now, the reaction of myoglobin with oxygen can be simplified to this reaction that I've written here. And if we take the rate of this reaction with the formulas that we know from biochemistry, we derive that the rate is equal to the concentration of myoglobin and the concentration of oxygen over the concentration of myoglobin binded to oxygen. The functional saturation of oxygen is denoted as YO2. With a little bit of algebra, and if you follow along, you can see that you can calculate this using the rate equation. And that once you've derived it all the way to where I have, you actually replace the concentrations of O2 with the pressures of O2, since oxygen is a gas. And the PO2 is often known as the oxygen tension, so if you were to see it in a question, it might say that as the verbiage.
Before I move on and talk about the hemoglobin, I'm going to talk a little bit about red blood cells. Red blood cells are formed in the bone marrow, obtaining hemoglobin from nucleated precursors. Red blood cells themselves are unnucleated, hence they do not divide. And it's interesting to note that they also don't have mitochondria. They get their energy from the Cori cycle. Also, another key word to know when you're talking about red blood cells is the hematocrit, which is the level of hemoglobin in total blood volume. Low concentrations of hemoglobin is referred to as anemia. Now I'm going to begin discussing hemoglobin. It is a tetrameric protein, each polypeptide with its own heme. There are many types of hemoglobin, all containing two pairs of non-identical chains. Hemoglobin A is the major adult hemoglobin, consisting of two alpha chains and two beta chains. It isn't as important to know their structure as it is to just know that those are the chains that it has. Hemoglobin A2 is the minor adult hemoglobin consisting of two alpha and two delta. Hemoglobin fetal consists of two alpha and two gamma chains. And it is important to note that the beta and gamma chains are closely related. Despite a few differences, it is, for our purposes, important to consider hemoglobin as four myoglobins, each holding hemes between their E7 and F8 histidines, and retaining hydrophobic cores. Also, when discussing hemoglobin, it is often discussed with the Hill equation, which is derived from the simplified equation that describes hemoglobin binding to oxygen. And this is the formula for the YO2, which is the functional saturation, where N is the Hill constant and increasing at, with the degree of cooperativity, ranging from 0 to 4 in hemoglobin. It is a positive value which exhibits the positive cooperativity of hemoglobin, which implies that when an oxygen binds to the first heme in hemoglobin, the second one binding is a lot easier, and then the third, and then the fourth is a lot, lot easier. It actually increases almost 100 to 300 times to bind the fourth oxygen. The Hill coefficient of humans is 2.8 to 3, and I believe that the 2.8 is for myoglobin as well. Now, I'm drawing a chart of the movement of oxygen in and out of the body from the lungs to the blood to the muscle and all the way back through exhaling and respiration. You can pause the video and look at the graph. I don't think I need to go through it. Um, it is a very kind of reaction and organic approach. Uh, it helps me to memorize things, though I don't think it's going to be tested too much on the MCAT. It's still good to look at to see how um, certain chemicals and molecules are going through your body. Now, the gases that come through our um, noses and mouth is not always just oxygen. Sometimes you have carbon monoxide. Now, carbon monoxide has a 200-fold greater affinity to bind to heme, binding to the ferrous state of hemoglobin and myoglobin. And if it does so, it's competing against um, the oxygen that we actually need to bind. This makes it a competitive antagonist. Fortunately, this is a reversible process and will eventually be displaced by the oxygen that we need. A common treatment for this condition would be hyperbaric oxygen to take out the carbon monoxide poisoning. Now, an interesting thing is you would not observe cyanosis even though that the oxygens are not bound. So, as I stated earlier, hemoglobin and myoglobin have the iron in the ferrous state. Um, but sometimes it is oxidized to the ferric state and it becomes methemoglobin or metmyoglobin. Both are unable to transport oxygen. Now, if you've taken organic chemistry, you understand the concept that, you know, a molecule doesn't exist in one state. It kind of alternates between many. So that kind of helps me to understand that this is always in our blood, but it's in very low quantities. And it can be formed by oxidization typically oxidized by aniline dyes, aromatic nitro compounds, and organic or inorganic nitrates. Now, most of the time you would think that we need the globin to bind our oxygen, so our red blood cells or erythrocytes have to fight this oxidation. Some ways to fight this oxidation are using azorbic acid or glutathione, which destroy oxidizing agents. Another way to combat this oxidization is for the heme to actually be bound to the APOP protein, which would shield the heme via stereochemistry. Patients who have congenital methemoglobinemia 
have structural abnormality in their alpha and beta chains, dissociation of the heme, which would rapidly oxidize in the presence of oxygen. The final way is to have methemoglobin reductase, which reduces methemoglobin via NADH. Now I'm going to discuss the difference between the oxygenated state versus the deoxygenated state. Now, we remember that hemoglobin can bind four oxygens to its four hemes, so it can be either oxyhemoglobin or deoxyhemoglobin. We refer to the deoxy form as the T state or the tense state, and the oxy form as the R state where all four oxygens are bound. Though, even if you have one oxygen bound, I think you would still refer to it as the R state. Now, the oxygen binding affinity for the R state is what's interesting. It's 150 to 300 times greater than that of the T state. This is the positive cooperativity we were referring to earlier. And if the Hill coefficient that we referred to earlier was a negative number, that would refer to a negative cooperativity, which is very rare, so we won't go into that. So, when we consider hemoglobin, it is an allosteric protein, interconverting between the conformation spontaneously by ligand binding. Now we will take a look at the oxygen binding curve. The P50 is the oxygen partial pressure where half the heme is oxygenated. The P50 of myoglobin is at 1 tor, and the P50 of hemoglobin is at 26 tor. I believe that the fetal hemoglobin's P50 is 22 or 24, it's a little bit less than regular hemoglobin, so that's interesting to note. It's also interesting to note that the lowest oxygen partial pressure is found in the capillaries of con contracting muscles where you actually find the myoglobin, and they are advantageously put there because they hold on to their oxygen better in areas of low concentration of oxygen. Because of hemoglobin's uh, positive cooperativity, it gives a sigmoidal shape to its curve. 2,3-bisphosphoglycerate, or BPG. BPG exists in erythrocytes at similar molar quantity as hemoglobin. It binds to the T-state of hemoglobin, further stabilizing its conformation, decreasing oxygen binding affinity without affecting the oxygenation of hemoglobin, which means that the oxygen can still bind to the hemoglobin, it's just that it benefits in unloading the oxygen to reach a more stabilized T-state once the BPG is bound. We would want this preferential unloading of oxygen in conditions such as hypoxic conditions, severe anemia, and adaptations to high altitude. We'd be able to give our body more of the oxygen as the T-state would be favored and the unloading of the hemoglobin would happen. This makes BPG a negative allosteric effector. This allosteric effect is known as a heterotropic effect, since it occurs between two different ligands. So if it was the oxygen that actually affected it, it would be a homotropic effect. BPG is interesting because it actually has no effect to fetal hemoglobin. It binds to the beta chains, but it cannot bind to the gamma chains of the fetal hemoglobin. Now we're going to discuss the Bohr effect. pH also reduces oxygen binding affinity of hemoglobin, and this pH is actually affected by the CO2 of oxidative metabolism, forming carbonic acid and then releasing hydrogen protons into the solution. Also, lactic acid is present in muscle cells and wherever oxygen is needed. This is an acidic environment, reducing oxygen binding affinity because the oxygenation of hemoglobin is more acidic than the deoxyhemoglobin. Thus, in high acidic environments, the deoxygenated form is favored. Carbon dioxide binds to the alpha and beta chains of hemoglobin, forming a carbamino hemoglobin, decreasing oxygen affinity as well by favoring the deoxygenated state. Thus, all three of these act as regulatory methods to release oxygen when desired. It actually took me a while to understand this process because it is so conceptual that maybe you want to pause the video and look back at what I was saying and look at the drawing above, and maybe even look at the chart I made earlier of the lung, blood, and muscle uh, transfer during exhaling and respiration. I also came across the term neuroglobin, and I found it interesting, so I did a little bit of research on it, and it's just the protein that is present in the blood of the brain, retina, and endocrine tissues. Its main function is to protect neurons from damage under conditions of ischemia by preventing reperfusion injury.
where ischemia is the inadequate blood supply to an organ or part of the body, and the injury is the damage caused by oxygen radicals generated when blood flow is restored. Another interesting uh, globin that I found is cytoglobin, which is in most tissues and has the same function. I'm not sure that the MCAT will test over this, but I've included it just in case. Finally, I just wanted to review some notes that I got from my Princeton review that might be outside of what I covered in this video, is that the level of oxygen decreases in active tissue due to oxidative phosphorylation, hence low hemoglobin oxygen affinity leading to the release of oxygen and thus giving oxygen to the active tissue. Another important note is that the tense state is preferred in low pH, in high oxygen tension, and high temperatures. Glucose metabolism yields a high partial pressure of carbon dioxide. When the cell is low on oxygen, it will lower the pH via lactic acid fermentation. All this metabolic activity increases the temperature, favoring the release of oxygen due to the Bohr effect. It's also important to know that the carbon dioxide functions as an allosteric antagonist for the hemoglobin, favoring the T-state.